Good afternoon. Happy Thyroid Awareness Month. <laughs> Good to see everyone. I'm seeing some miles from smiles showing up, so I'm assuming my audio is coming through all right. Can I get a thumbs up out there? All right, thank you. Hey, we got an awesome group here. We've got a couple hundred folks and counting coming on fast. So this is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, this has been one of the topics that you've asked about more than anything. And I had a really unwieldy long blog post that was about 20,000 words. And I thought, this is too much. I need to just like explain this to people. So here we are, we'll do three parts of this and we'll make sense out of how to lower thyroid antibodies. So this will all be good. Uh, thyroid Awareness Month. This has taken place for over about 14 years now. It's an officially recognized month. And this is in collaboration with World Thyroid Awareness Day which is May 25th. Um, some big events coming up for Thyroid Awareness Day as well. That one's a little newer. This is going to be the 11th annual event for that one. But yeah, this is, this is January and a good, good time to celebrate and talk about this. You know, thyroid disease, uh, you know, I don't have to tell you guys, but it's, it's gone up. It's affecting more people than ever. The real uptick seemed to be in the late 80s and the early 90s. And it's not been slowing down just yet. You know, among the topics we'll cover will make sense out of the reasons for that. But there's been so much new exciting research and the upshot of it is that there are more solutions than ever. And I'm really happy to share this with you guys. And honestly, this topic, as important as this is, I've never really gone through it as comprehensively myself until this recent past. So it's fun to, fun to share and fun to talk through this. Uh, give you guys a real quick overview of what we're gonna talk about. This is gonna be the section about diet and food. This is the first in a three-part series. So stay tuned. Um, let me make sure that I have recording going. That was part of the plan. Let's see. Um, ha, okay. Yep, my team set it up so that I could be <laughs> the absent-minded professor and things would still work. <laughs> and thus they did. Thanks, you guys. So this is going to be our first of three parts. This is going to be about all about diet and foods. The second one, which we'll do in February, a date to be determined, stay tuned, will focus on the role medications can play and their effects upon thyroid antibodies. And the third one, which will be in March, will be about supplements. You know, quite a bit of research on various supplements. You know, and in putting this together, I'm going to talk about what, what can, can most likely make a really big difference, what might help. And then things that are talked about a lot, but maybe don't have as much basis for them. And I debated about this. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time myth busting, but I don't want you to chase your tail. I don't want you to put a lot of energy into things that might not be helpful. So I will just cover those things briefly. And I'll be jabbering for 45, 60 minutes, something like that. And at the end of that, I'll grab a couple of questions and we'll have about 30 minutes available for that. So this is a big group. I'm happy to have you guys all here. I may not get through all of them. I'm going to do my best. So just know that if you do have one, let's see how many we can cover and you know, put yours together as succinctly as you can. So start thinking about it and I'll do what I can to make sense out of those. I've also got the office hours live, which are most Mondays. So those are available. And if you do want to ask a question, but you've got no clue how to use Zoom, like that's, it, it still baffles me sometimes. Take a look in our chat section. And I put a little chat comment at the very beginning, and there was a link in that showing how to raise your hand in a Zoom call. So that's it. All right, so let's dive in. What we'll be talking about, how to lower thyroid antibodies. This is the dietary basis. There's three main things that have pretty large amounts of evidence behind them. And one's going to be regulating iodine. I'll give that some depth. I won't go crazy in depth on that one because I have talked about that a lot. And that's the focus of the new book as well, um, my team suggested to mention uh, Target, uh, target.com and also Amazon still have the book for half off, which is really cool. So that's, that's available there. And there are bonuses at thyroidresetdiet.com, which are more than the value of the book. <laughs> so that's a cool thing still available. Yeah, it's funny how pricing works. I, I told you guys, I, as an author, I have to pay more for the book when I buy it in bulk than I can buy it as an Amazon Prime member, as an individual. <laughs> That's life. 
So He's we'll talk ready. about iodine. We'll talk about balancing fuel. There's a lot of data about our body composition and its relevance to thyroid antibodies, and also about just all plant categories and their role. The first section I'm going to talk about is about the antibodies themselves. We'll cover some basics to help make sense of what these are, what their relevance is, and to give you a good sense on how they can be affecting your health. Now, in a lot of cases, when people talk about the effects of the antibodies, they're overlapping that with the effects of having abnormal thyroid levels. That makes sense. You know, in most cases, when someone has really high antibodies, that's discovered because they've also got abnormal thyroid function. So sometimes it can be hard to discern which symptoms or which problems are being caused by the antibodies and which are caused by being hypothyroid or hyperthyroid. And this discussion, I've worked hard to pull those things apart. So this really is about the antibodies. So please know that if your thyroid levels are not healthy, that by itself could do a lot more than the antibodies could by themselves. So this is really assuming that we've already done some work to square away thyroid levels. They're pretty close to a good range, but there's still high antibodies there. And what are they going to be doing all by themselves? That'll be, and what can you do about that? So that'll be our focus for this discussion. And a little more depth about the topics. Yeah, we'll give an overview of the antibodies. You know, should you lower yours? Uh, how iodine relates to those, the fuel, the plant categories. And I'll talk a bit at the later section about autoimmune paleo, about gluten, about soy, and then we will do some Q&A. So some basics. Um, for starters, <laughs> this is the antithyroid peroxidase uh, antibody. You know, when I see that picture, I don't know why I get this image from, but I get an image of like confetti and, and streamers, like party things going all over the place in the air. And <laughs> that's not what we really think about. It's not a joyous thing, but that's a pictomicrograph of its molecular structure. Um, I'm going to hold this next picture up for a little bit. There's a lot of funny words and squiggly lines, and don't panic. We'll, we'll talk through it. It'll make sense. But here's kind of the big picture of how the sausage gets made in the factory, so to speak. And I'll talk about the relevance of antibodies in here. Now, when this works right, you all can see my cursor moving around. Can I get a thumbs up if my cursor is showing up? I'm seeing some nodding taking place. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. So here's where the story starts. It starts in your bloodstream. And I'm going to go over here and orient us first. So this is a cluster of cells within the thyroid. This is called a follicle. And this is like a little nursery of thyroid cells, or like they, they circle the wagon, so to speak. And they've got this area of space inside of them. And now we're gonna blow up on this one cell and that little bit of colloid in it. And that's what the rest of this image is. So all this here is just one of those cells. And these cells, these follicles, there are just millions of these within the thyroid, these little structures. Now outside this follicle, there's some blood supply. The blood is moving through this. And in the blood, we have iodine. And to be really precise, this I minus means it's iodide. So it's, it's a different form of iodine. And this is pumped in. Now, a lot of what we talk about will be important because of this pump. So this is called the sodium iodide symporter, NA is short for sodium. Uh, the old Latin name was natrium. So yeah, this is the pump that pulls iodine in and it uses sodium across the gradient to do that. So iodine first is coming inside the cell. So it's inside this thyroid follicular cell. And from there, another compound called pendrin pushes it across the inside of the cell. And now it's inside this follicle. Now it's floating around inside this follicle. Um, other things happening in this cell, there's the endoplasmic reticulum. Who's heard about the mitochondria? It's had a lot of a lot of press lately in natural health space. I'm seeing some hands go up. Yeah. So the mitochondria is collaborating with the endoplasmic reticulum. And the endoplasmic reticulum, also called the ER, uh, it makes different proteins. And so the protein it makes here is thyroglobulin. And you guys might've heard about thyroglobulin antibodies. And yeah, those are just antibodies that attack this protein. Well, this protein is kind of a scaffold on which all the thyroid hormones get made. So here's where the cell made it, and here's where it got squirted into this follicle. So now what we got going on, here's our cast of characters. We've got this follicle, and we have thyroglobulin, and we have iodine inside of it. 
Well, once iodine gets inside the follicle, a lot of it gets oxidized and it's oxidized by thyroid peroxidase, that's TPO. So when it is oxidized, now this iodide becomes iodine. <laughs> I'm exaggerating it to make the distinction clear. So once it's oxidized, it sticks onto thyroglobulin. And then these little clusters of cells, they bud together. They get pushed out back into the cell and then squirted back into the bloodstream. And along the way, they get pulled off of thyroglobulin. So proteins, protein dissolving enzymes, pull these hormones off of thyroglobulin, almost like you're snapping little parts off of a plastic template they came in, and then they're pushed in the bloodstream. So far, so good. So what happens is thyroglobulin has specific places on which iodine can attach. And that's what this is, this long little colorful chain of beads, that's just that thyroglobulin protein. And all these spots, these are called tyrosol residues. They are where iodine can go on. Now, in a full-scale model, there would actually be about 13 of these residues per thyroglobulin molecule. And when they're filled up, then it becomes formed into those hormones. The wrinkle that we'll talk about is that there can be too much iodine on the molecule. And in those cases, then, there's just more free radical damage. So the generalization is that when there's more, more stress, more inflammatory stress, then the body starts to attack these structures that are normally in the thyroid. And that can include the protein thyroglobulin, but also this enzyme thyroid peroxidase. They can come under attack. Now, this is a little bit of a nuance, but it's not the antibodies are there as the damage is going on. So the antibodies themselves are not causing the damage but they're often just signs saying there is damage happening. So that's not to say that they aren't important or that things that change them are not important because when you do lower them, you often do lower the things that go along with them. We think most of the attack is carried out by various cytokines. You guys might've heard of that term in the news with COVID and COVID complications. Yeah, these are compounds that trigger strong inflammatory immune responses and they can take place throughout the body. But yeah, it's driven by cytokines, but these antibodies are bellwether indicators of the presence of cytokines. There's a really goofy joke I heard a while back about this. Uh, this police, police officer, and he saw a man stumbling through an alleyway at night. And this guy is looking on the ground and the cop says, what are you doing? And the guy says, I lost my keys. I can't find my keys. And he goes, well, probably shouldn't be driving anyway. Did, did you lose him out here? He goes, no, I lost him back there in the alley. He goes, well, why are we looking at, why are you looking for him out here? Is well, it was too dark back there. <laughs> Couldn't see anything. <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot of things in medicine that we measure what we can see, even though it's not the best thing to measure. <laughs> and that's that's the story for thyroid antibodies. They're really not where the keys are at, but they are in the light. They're under the they're under the street lamp, so we can see them better. So even though they're not perfectly representative of the immune process, they happen to be the one thing that we can get a grasp on and get relatively good readings on. So. Then the question is, how does this whole thing drive thyroid disease to perpetuate? Well, generalization, the extra iodine changes how the immune system works. We've got this Th1, Th2 pathways, and overall, they help your immune system decide if you should attack something or not. And when these balances are off, we can start to attack things that are harmless, that belong inside of us. Then we'll see the thyroglobulin get oxidized through too much iodination. And then we've got apoptosis, which is cell death. The thyroid cells start to die. Uh, regulating cells, T-regulating cells become compromised and the attack cells get turned on. Uh, then we'll find out that there's eventual autoimmune thyroid disease. But this is the big picture of that. Um, I'm gonna talk one more thing. We're, we're almost through the hard science part, you guys. I'm looking at everyone. Everyone's got their eyes wide open and, and focused. So I don't think I've lost anyone just yet. You guys are doing really good. <laughs> you know, if I can figure something out, you guys can too. It's just not, 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 nothing unique about any of us. So here's the story about that pump that we mentioned. This is that sodium iodide symporter. Now, when there's a lot of iodine, what happens is the pump starts to shut things off and the amount of hormone gets lowered. And what that does, it causes a lot of iodine to get oxidized and these compounds form, which start to attack and slow down 
thyroid peroxidase, and they're also damaging thyroglobulin. So that's our big paradox is that more of what you need to work makes you not work. <laughs> it actually slows things down. There are some people, for whatever reason, they don't do this very well. Uh, we call this the wolf chaikoff effect. And this is the thyroid shutting itself down in response to a flood of iodine. Those who can't do that well, when they get extra iodine, they make massively unsafe amounts of thyroid hormone. And that's called the yod basedow effect. And that's where a lot of Graves' disease seems to come on from. So now we'll get a little more depth into the main things we know that drive the antibodies. We talked a bit about that. Um, the paper that Dr. Hashimoto wrote defining how autoimmune thyroid disease work was 1907. So we had our century pass of that, and a lot of researchers have said, well, what do we know? What are the clear irrefutable causes? And these are the top three. We argue that age, gender, and iodine are the big ones. And of the controllable factors, one researcher had a quote, and he said that iodine is not the only controllable factor, but if you combine all the other controllable factors, it is more relevant than all the others combined. It's a bigger fact, it's a bigger thing than all other factors combined. So it's a big deal. So for and on, a lot of little things could go in that bucket, but all together, if you add them up, their effect size is rather large. So a few more details on how this happens. Generalization, we'll see that the white blood cells, there's different types of white blood cells, and these are, these are ones called lymphocytes. They can be responsible for viral infections, and that's why I think about viruses being related to thyroid disease. And they get drawn into the thyroid when the cells are damaged. And if that goes on too long, they start to get used to attacking those cells and going after them. We see this oxidative injury from extra iodine damaging the cells. And then the thyroglobulin protein autoantigenicity, what that means is that your body gets allergic to it. You know, an antigen is a little tiny piece of something that your immune system goes after. So you start to have autoantigens against thyroglobulin. Your body's immune system thinks it looks weird. And then we have a breakdown of thyroglobulin. We're dissolving the protein. And yeah, this is one of the big synopsis quotes of our day about what we see is that iodine is an environmental risk factor for autoimmune thyroid disease, especially in those who are susceptible. Wrong way, there we go. Um, another big quote, and this is kind of the paradox too, is that you don't have to be crazy about it, just, just a little above your physiologic needs, it can be a problem. And this is, this is not for everyone. You know, there's a lot of folks that can take some extra here and there and just pee out the excess and do fine with it. But they're not the ones prone to thyroid disease. You know, I just had an email conversation with one of the uh, gals in my staff, uh, Jamie, and she was reading the book. I, she got a copy a little early. And she said how I had a quote about how it was like a strained relationship between iodine and the thyroid. And she said, well, how could that be? You know, the body's worked with that for so long. Why do things not work better? And it was a good question. There was a story that I had in the book, but had to get cut in the edits because there's just so much extra stuff that wouldn't fit. So the story is that we think there was a couple of main types of humans. We think that a lot of people grew up uh, and lived their lives for millennia near coastal regions. And they had bivalves and mollusks, you know, clams and whatnot. They had plenty of seafood. They probably had a lot of sea vegetables. And over time, they adapted their bodies to be able to tolerate lots of iodine. They almost never went without it, so they didn't have to scavenge it. And when they got a lot of it, they could safely diffuse it. They got really good at that. But the trade-off was if they were in an area that was sparse in iodine, they would have been in tough shape because they didn't have the means to just suck up every little speck of it. They had to give that part up. Now, the other main variation we have is ancestors that were in inland areas, especially far inland. And if they had low iodine soils, they had to have the opposite sets of traits. They had to do a really good job just always sucking up every little speck of iodine and holding on to it. Now, if they suddenly were in a coastal area, they couldn't do well because they had no means to deal with a lot of iodine. So we think that that's how we got genetic diversity on our iodine tolerance. And we're all, we're all such mixed mutts nowadays that there's no real ethnic predictability on those sorts of things, but there's a variation in our tolerance of iodine. And we think that's why. So those who don't tolerate the big occasional excess amounts 
are those more susceptible to it? And the link is really striking. So here was one study looking at a gentleman and here was his TSH scores and here were his iodine levels. And you can see how these things correlated. I think most of you all know that uh, high TSH scores mean low thyroid function. We think that healthy thyroid function is gonna be somewhere around here. He was markedly hypothyroid. And whenever his iodine levels were high, his TSH was higher, his thyroid was more shut down and everywhere in between. So he was checked several times over the course of almost three years. And you could see how his iodine and his thyroid scores just moved in lockstep with one another. And this is quite typical. You know, the more we get, the more this can affect us. Um, and then what we've seen is that the uh, antibodies do also have some predictive value on disease progression. It's not as strong as you might think, but it is there. So this was a pretty cool study. And this looked at a large number of people and it compared the presence of thyroid antibodies and also the level, you know, the, the, how high they were with how likely they were to have their thyroid slow down. So you can see that here's their thyroid peroxidase and this is I use per mil. This one's all, these two are always in the same units. Uh, they were below 100. Here they were one to 500 over five, I'm sorry, less than 500 altogether, and then well over 500. So here's anti-TPO, anti-thyroid globulin, and both. And here's where they've got hyperthyroidism. Here's normal range thyroid function, and then here's outside normal range. And you see by these percentages, so people to where they've got both antibodies severely elevated, well, about a third of them are hypothyroid. And a lot of them are hyperthyroid. There's many that are out. So there's the smaller number of those who are stable. And if you go on the opposite end, people to where they're both low, you can see that a much higher percent have normal function. And about what? About a third as many are hyper. And about a third as many, I'm sorry, about a third as many are hyper. And about a third as many are hypo. So this is how these things are predictive. And the levels matter. You know, if they're positive or negative or not, that by itself affects the risk of the disease progressing. And then how high they are matters. This study did see that there was a significant threshold right around 500. And they chose these numbers after analysis, that this was a big threshold. The further they get above 500, the more they do predict disease progression, meaning the thyroid slowing down. And when they're both like that, it's more relevant than if either is like that. So you can see that if we've got just thyroglobulin, we're seeing the number of, there's more people who have stable function. And then if it's just thyroid peroxidase, but if it's both, that number is smallest. So yeah, so knowing about your antibodies is helpful and knowing about their levels. I do hear people talk about, I went from 80 to 30, you know, 80 to 40, um, 100 to something. Yeah, these fluctuations within under 100 or between 100 and 500, don't make a large difference. Fluctuations that are outside of 500 versus 100, that does matter. But anywhere between one to 500 is not too different from one point to the next. Above 500 is different than below 500. And below 100 is different than above hey. that. But within these categories, not a lot of big distinctions. I'm on a listening to Zoom. I'm <laughs> remute here, there we go. Okay. and. What we see too, remember I mentioned before how antibodies may be factors for symptoms, even when um, overall thyroid levels are stable. Here was a paper that talks about that. And what they showed was that these are people that had normal levels of thyroid hormones, but they had high antibodies. And they looked at actually a lot of different symptoms, but these are the couple that showed up as being the most likely to be driven by the antibodies. This was a paper just from this last year. And this one showed that, yeah, we'll see things like uh, hair breakage, you know, fragile hair that's thin and breaking easily, swelling, especially eyes in the voice, eyes in the face, and then the voice, you know, changes in the voice. And that often correlates with just the thyroid gland itself enlarging. So this is how these things play out. And as a generalization, the dark columns are those who had the highest levels of antibodies and the uh, grayer column are those that have the lower ones. So we can see that these symptoms are, are higher in those who have the higher levels of antibodies. And that can be quite a big difference, 
even independent of their thyroid function. But do note that this is really showing up more so when the antibodies are up. So here we're seeing a threshold of 300, you know, this 500 range. So this is a recurrent theme. 500 is a number that the further you get above, the more relevant antibodies can become. And we see this one too. This was kind of interesting. This was a, a study and they took people who had significant symptoms. They had hyp hypothyroidism and high levels of antibodies and they were stabilized. So their thyroid levels were stable, but they were still symptomatic and still had high antibodies. Many of them had painful thyroiditis. So their thyroid glands were just extremely sore and inflamed to the touch. Some were given surgical thyroidectomies and the thought was maybe this will help to cure them. Now, I don't put this up because I advocate thyroidectomies for Hashimoto's, really no one does, but it's kind of a case study in that when the antibodies are brought down by any means, how that might affect symptoms. So those that received the surgery, their antibody levels did go down. There was just less thyroid tissue there. And what happened was their general health scores, those that had higher scores for negative persistent symptoms, they did quite a bit better than those in the control group especially over some time. Higher numbers were better here. And fatigue scores, in this case, lower numbers were better. They started out high and most were down closer to a normal range. Whereas those that didn't improve, uh, there were about twice as many were still chronically fatigued and symptomatic. So the take home message is the antibodies do matter. And we've seen this for these particular symptoms when the antibodies are quite high and the one other point in which they can be relevant is fertility as well. There has been data arguing that when they're high, even if thyroid function is stabilized, they can affect fertility. And that's especially true for thyroid peroxidase, especially when it's well over 1,000. So that's, that's even higher. So they, they can matter. Now, if you're someone to where you've not yet stabilized your thyroid levels or your antibodies are perhaps both well under 100, or your symptoms are different from these symptoms, or there's other things causing the symptoms, they may not be your highest priority. But in these cases where they're quite high and some of these symptoms are there and you've already stabilized thyroid function, they can be relevant. So let's start diving into what we know about diet for thyroid antibodies. And first I'm gonna talk about just three popular approaches that get a lot of questions. And then I'll talk about some things that we know from our latest research. So popular dietary approaches, I think these are the ones that I hear people put the most discussion on, um, gluten, soy, autoimmune paleo. Now, my take on things is that if you do something that's not dangerous and not crazy expensive and it helps you, I'm all for you doing that thing. <laughs> I'd love for you to keep doing that thing. So, but, but when someone does ask and say, hey, there's this thing that, that someone says will help me, but it's really hard and I don't know what I should do then I'll give you the research. And if the research suggests, hey, suck it up and do it, it's gonna help you, then that's what I'll tell you. But if the research says, huh, that may not be helpful as consistently as we thought, then I'm gonna tell you that. You know, We've all got so many hours in the day and so much effort to put into things. And I want you to put your efforts into what's gonna make the biggest difference. So we'll cover these real quick. Um, gluten, this was a fascinating one. This is really the, the one study you can find showing that Gluten-free diets helped people lower thyroid antibodies. Now, here's the weird thing. Um, this was these were people that were, were said to not have celiac disease. However, they only included people in the study that had positive celiac antibodies, which is kind of odd. And I've read this study so many times to make sure I've not gotten anything wrong. But no, they had positive celiac antibodies. Everyone else was rejected. So they had celiac disease. They had not priorly had a formal diagnosis of it, but they did have it. And what they saw was that um, going gluten-free for them, it didn't actually change their thyroid scores. There was no big differences. It did. Oh, wow, now I made a mark on that. Oh, no, someone else did. Huh, that's curious. Apparently, someone has the ability to draw on these. Um, please don't. <laughs> I, I can't even do that myself. I probably could, but I don't know how. So anyway, yeah, their antibodies did come down by 24 and 25%, but in this case, it didn't actually change their thyroid function. They also saw no changes in digestive symptoms. So that was the closest study to one that showed 
And this is actually the one I always talked about. People say that even those without celiac disease, this can be a factor. And honestly, this wasn't really a study of those that don't have celiac disease. So here is, yeah, that line is now stuck with me. <laughs> I saw a name when that line appeared. If whoever, if you could possibly erase it, I don't know. <laughs> but I don't know how it got there. So this was a study of those with celiac. Um, now we've got someone else drawing. Hmm. Oh, I think I'm probably trying to erase that. <laughs> you know, whoever that was, if you could even undo, that might make the last ones go away if you got an undo option. So in this one, they took a group that had, that did have celiac disease. They were newly diagnosed. They had been, had the disease picked up rather recently. And they'd had stable thyroid function for the prior year. Now, the thought was they wanted to see how many developed thyroid disease in their first year of being gluten-free. And the thought was that, uh, that there should be fewer that get thyroid disease that go gluten-free than those that don't. And they could check their compliance by watching some markers of, of um, anti-glutaminase antibodies. And what it turned out basically was that there were, let me just get the next one here, uh, there were five people that did develop thyroid disease after they went gluten-free, but there weren't differences between those who did or did not go gluten-free. So just as many who avoided gluten still got thyroid disease, and just as many who had gluten did not get thyroid disease. So this was the biggest study like that, and the conclusion of that was that there was just no, no real relationship um, those with celiac disease certainly should go gluten-free. It's important for many facets of their health. And they should be tracked for thyroid disease. But going gluten-free didn't keep them from getting thyroid disease. So the researcher said there was no implications for those without it. So should you go gluten-free? Um, yeah, if it helps, if it makes a difference for digestion, other symptoms. However, I would argue against cutting out all, all grain products. You know, Only those that contain gluten are probably worth thinking about. And, and cutting out processed grain products, though, that's even a good thing, even the gluten-free ones. But there's not, there's not some special way in which you need to because of having thyroid disease. So I think a lot of times people can go get better by going gluten-free because they're consuming fewer processed grains. That lowers their iodine. In some cases, they may lose weight because of that as well. Really quickly mention autoimmune paleo. Um, this was a study, the, the one study that was published. This was 16 women, uh, average age of 35. They had Hashis and they went autoimmune paleo for two and a half months. The conclusion of the study was that they saw no changes in any measure of thyroid function, TSH, free T3, free T4, as well as thyroid antibodies. However, I do think that there are those who have gone AIP and felt better from that. And again, they're probably cutting out a lot of extra iodine. You know, they go off processed grains, they're off of dairy and eggs. And in many cases, they're not doing iodized salt and they might drop a few pounds. So those things could all be helpful onto themselves. But just the AIP apart alone in the one study that was done uh, didn't show to have a change in the thyroid markers. And the last one in this vein will be about soy. And soy is something that lots of, lots of strong ideas about and also tons and tons of studies done about soy. And this was a very recent paper. This was just uh, last year. And basically, they pulled together 4,925 <laughs> citations. I've read a lot of studies on soy and thyroid disease, but I've not read all 4,900 of them. I, won't, I wouldn't claim that. Their conclusions, quite simply, were that there was no soy had no effect on thyroid hormones. What they did see was that many papers have shown that soy may benefit cardiovascular health, uh, less risk of metabolic syndrome, less risk of diabetes. Uh, bone health, and postmenopausal symptoms. There's even been some strong data about soy being useful as a preventive for breast cancer, and even those who have had hormonally sensitive breast cancer. So these are benefits we can get from many ways. You know, you can get these benefits by a variety of plant foods, exercise, and sleep. No one has to consume soy, but I wouldn't worry about soy as being a big driver for thyroid disease. Now, there are those that have soy allergy and those that feel better without it. It's totally fine. But if you're wondering where to put, which basket to put your eggs in, where to put the most focus on, I wouldn't think about that one as being the most important. So I'll talk a bit about iodine regulation. And again, learning the whole basis of thyroid disease, being how it's driven by iodine trapped in the thyroid, 
it makes sense that this would be a relevant factor for that. So we just think about the main iodine sources, that that we have from supplements, uh, from the high iodine foods, and then also the hidden iodine sources. And the hand sanitizers, those were recently updated, which was good, they no longer have that, but cosmetics still do. And this is one of the points I highlight in the book. I put a big list of all the hidden names of iodine products in cosmetics. And it adds up. You know, it's not a large mass, but you don't need a large mass when it comes to iodine. You can take a shower and get thousands of micrograms in your system from personal care products. And then some foods have just erratic amounts of iodine. So the baked goods, the dairy. Now, thyroid medications, they have it. And I think I put this message out badly in the past. Uh, when you're thinking about your day's total iodine intake, you don't really need to consider what's in your thyroid medications. Now, that's true as long as you're not taking too much. If your dose is higher than it should be, meaning the TSH starts to dip down, then the iodine in them starts to add up. But assuming it's not the case, you can leave that out of your equations. So yeah, because what happens is your body would make that iodine in your own hormones anyway. So it's not an extra amount coming in. So that's there, but it doesn't really change the equation. And here's how that's affected those with Hashimoto's under pretty controlled conditions. This was an awesome study. So 45 patients who had Hashimoto's, they were just given iodine restriction. They were kept under 100 micrograms per day. And it's no coincidence that, that that's my target for the reset phase of the thyroid reset diet. Uh, one control group did not, uh, one group did. They were about 41 years old, mostly female, and they'd had thyroid disease for two to four years. Average TSH score, 14.28. So a lot of you are savvy about the number and please forgive me, but some, some may not be. The TSH is the thyroid stimulating hormone. It's your pituitary gland asking your thyroid to work. And the more sluggish your thyroid is, the higher that number goes. Most labs say you're normal up to four and a half. Healthy people are probably more like one or so but 14 is high, <laughs> 14 is a high TSH. And that was the average. There was actually a lot of people that had TSH scores in the 50, 100, and 200 range. So the one and only thing they did was the iodine regulation for three months. What they saw was that the iodine levels before the diet didn't make any difference whatsoever. It didn't predict who would get better and who would not. And that's why I don't push you guys to run out and test your iodine before doing the diet, because it just doesn't matter. What they did see though, is that those that didn't get better after the fact often still had high levels of iodine. And what happens is if you've got a lot of iodine in your system, you don't always see it in your urine because a lot of it's trapped in your thyroid. It's only after you've gone low iodine. If you've done that, and then you've got a lot of iodine coming out, it means you're not done yet. It means your body is still detoxing or you've just got a lot coming into your system from some source still. So cool thing is three months, TSH scores, remember that 14.28? They went down to three. Their average score went down to three within three months. They did nothing else. They didn't go on medications. They didn't stand on their heads. They did nothing else but regulate their iodine. Um, you guys see the infomercials like they're, uh, but wait, there's more. <laughs> well, there's more. It gets even better. <laughs> so here's the ones that got better. So the ones that didn't get them better, didn't get better, well, a lot of them improved. So many of them, their scores went down by 50% or more. They weren't yet in the normal range, but they were sure the heck heading that way. They just needed a little bit more time. And there was also then just a few who didn't respond. And in most cases, they were still putting out high amounts of iodine. So they didn't respond because they just weren't yet on target. Maybe they needed more time as well or maybe they just missed the instructions, or maybe they were trying, I don't know, no judgment, but <laughs> they probably had iodine still coming in from somewhere. So yeah, there was really only one person in this study who did eliminate iodine, but didn't get better. Everyone else either didn't eliminate iodine or just didn't get all the way better yet. So <laughs> that just completely lights me up every time I see that. The study has hit me like a ton of bricks and there's others like that. So iodine regulation, quick overview of that. Super basic thing, you know, grab the book, uh, do the green light foods. It's that easy. And I made it to where it's, it's a healthy diet overall, and it's a well-rounded diet. I even have a registered dietitian friend that I collaborated with. So 
the normal diets that are low in iodine, they were just made to do for a few weeks before you would do like a scan. And when it's short term, that's fine, but this is something you might do for three, six, nine months. And I wanted to make sure that it was nutritionally complete, that it was easy, and that it was simple. So all you do is do green light foods. And this is a short list, but you know, there's green light foods in every food category. There's tons of options. And then once you get to target, then you go in the maintenance phase. <laughs> I heard someone recently, uh, anyone ever uh, taken kids or grandkids to Chuck E. Cheese? <laughs> No judgment. I've been there. <laughs> so the kids play in the, in the various games, and then you get these tickets, right? And you get this stack of tickets, and you can go trade those in on all these completely worthless things that seem like the most valuable thing in the world in the moment. <laughs> so, so the maintenance phase, here's, here's the tickets. You got two tickets. You can spend your tickets on wherever you want. You get two servings of yellow light foods. <laughs> you can do... Yeah, some Greek yogurt. You can loosen up on the types of seafood. You can do some egg yolk, whatever. You got lots of options. But that's where you spend your tickets is on the yellow light foods when you're in maintenance. <laughs> but yeah, it's that simple. So the next of the three big topics I want to mention is fuel balance, is getting the amount of fuel the body needs. And this is interesting. There's lots of data about how fuel works in the system. And I think about it, you know, you've got carbohydrates, fats, ketones, even alcohol. So all these things are made into triglycerides or, or carbs are made into glycogen. And all of this is broken down into something called acetyl acetate. And that's, that's what that is. So they're kind of all the same. And when there's too much of that, what that does is it causes fat cells to bind up with immune cells and put out the chemicals of inflammation. And that's all this stuff, C-reactive protein, sedrate, interleukin, tumor necrosis factor alpha. So basically, these fat immune complexes are amongst the biggest drivers of inflammation in the body. You know, I hear many experts talk about these, these things that they can be real concerns. They can be these exotic situations of, uh, boy, you know, mold or, or whatever. But honestly, this is like the low-hanging fruit. This is the biggest this is the biggest physical source of cytokines in the body assuming we're not infected. This is where most inflammatory cells come from is they come from these fat cells coupled with macrophages. So we quantified this by the height to waist ratio or the overwaste and what happens is these fat cells they become more filled up and when they're overfilled that's when the immune cells come in. There's been a lot of data showing that these Adipocytes predict thyroid antibody elevations. So here is one study, for example, uh, fasting glucose, insulin levels, these can have large effects predicting elevations of thyroid antibodies. This is true for both thyroid peroxidase and thyroglobulin. This is a bigger driver than next to next. And I honestly I put these in order on purpose. So iodine is number one, it's fuel overload is number two. This is the second largest driver, best documented, also known to reverse thyroid antibodies that we know about. So you want to clear out those extra fat cell macrophage complexes. And that was really about the whole metabolism reset diet. And that's what that was written towards. And I get the question a lot about how does this combine with the thyroid reset diet? Well, the basic idea here is, yeah, you do some kind of a shake, breakfast and lunch, Try to work in resistant starch, veggie protein, have a meal at night, you got some veggies, you do a lot of sleep, micro workouts, uh, and it's easy to combine those two things. What we often see is that, I'm going to go forward to, is that basically you want to do these guidelines using the green light foods. So it's that simple. Almost everything in the metabolism reset diet, almost all those foods are already green light foods, but there were a couple kinds of seafood that were not. So that's the only difference. Just follow that program and use these green light foods and you can get two at once. Now, the metabolism reset, you only do that for 28 days. That's not a long-term thing. Whereas the thyroid reset, you can do that for up to nine months, as long as your thyroid is still getting better. But yeah, if there's some extra height to waste, if there's some weight around the middle that you feel better without, then just do the metabolism reset using the foods from this green light list. And remember I mentioned before, the big driver of antibodies, we're talking about glucose, uh, insulin, and also waste. 
So these are common reductions. This is an average from a study that we did on the metabolism reset diet. You know, 17 points down on the glucose, uh, four points lower on insulin, two to five inches off the waist, resting heart rate about 12 points lower. And these were just within just the first month of that. So, so yeah, fuel is a big driver of thyroid antibodies. Okay, so next up, plant categories. This is kind of cool. This was a big study done in Croatia. Um, did you guys know that Dalmatians were more than just dogs? <laughs> I didn't know that until I read about this study. So yeah, Croatians are a group of, I'm sorry, Dalmatians are a subgroup of ethnic Croatians. I had no idea. Um, I'm sure someone here is already well aware of that, knows much more about it than I do. But these people have done some really good tracking of health outcomes following various dietary changes. There was a large, large study that's, that's, that's been done on them for quite a few years, actually called the 10,001 Dalmatian study, the Croatian Biobank study. And they were, they were completely, oops, they were completely playing off the 101 Dalmatians. They were having fun with it. But yeah, this was the 10,001 Dalmatian study. And it was looking at primarily women, uh, mostly in their mid 50s, and mostly BMI of 27. So BMI of 27, we call that early stage of overweight. You know, 25 and above is overweight, 30 and above is obese. So these are women who were mildly overweight and by and large had thyroid disease. And what they showed was that certain, they, they broke down foods into these various categories, and I'll explain what those are. And they, what they showed was that some categories the more those categories were present, the more likely they were to have elevated thyroid antibodies. And other ones, the more the categories were absent, the less likely they were to have thyroid antibodies. So some food categories were very helpful and some food categories were very harmful is how that played out. And let me give you guys the details. I'm putting this into more simple, not just their coded stuff. So these are the ones that had the biggest effects upon lowering thyroid antibodies. Uh, whole grains, nuts, rolled oats. And honestly, I don't know how they categorized, how they made these categories, because some of them had like three, four things that I don't quite see how they fit together. But anyway, <laughs> somehow or other they did. So the biggest thing, the largest effect lowering thyroid antibodies was, was this category. Um, yeah. And I see many that cut out a lot of grains completely. And we know that our flora, our gut health is really important. And our flora is fed by indigestible portions of carbohydrate. We think about fiber as a thing, but it's really a category. There's about like 16 kinds of fiber in the diet. Once you cut out whole grains and legumes, you only have access to about six kinds of fiber. You miss out on uh, 10 kinds of fiber when you cut out those food categories. So the Dalmatians that had the least tendency to develop thyroid antibodies were the ones most likely to consume whole grains, nuts, um, and especially rolled oats. That was the number one up there. So here was our other categories. And I did put these in order of how large their effect size was. Vegetables and legumes were, were next up. Same thing, many will miss out on legumes. Great positive effects from them. Fruit, nuts showed up more than once. And then chicken and beef and squid. <laughs> and this is funny because, uh, you know, I've never thought much about squid either way until I wrote the last book. It's, it's a pretty cool food. So it's very sustainable. Uh, it's extremely low in iodine. It's easy to find, it's cost-effective. So I, I get the frozen squid steaks from, the, from like, like a Whole Foods or even regular supermarkets. And it's funny, there are these big rectangles. I don't know if you guys have heard of them before or not. There are these big rectangles. You thaw them out, you sear them. You, know, you got some salt and pepper and some lemon, nothing complicated. You flip them over and sear them again. And they're really good. They're if you have like calamari in the fried calamari in the restaurant, it's nothing like that at all. It's like a really nice fish steak and they're great, great to work with. So yeah, it's one of my new favorite types of seafood now. So then the question is, what about the categories on the other side of that equation, which were the categories that had the worst effect on thyroid antibodies? And that's what we saw here. So the, the biggest one was actually butter and animal fats. They were, they were put together they had the largest effect elevating thyroid antibodies. And it's a funny thing. I hear many talk about how, how good saturated fats are. Um, and the, the truth is our body does use palmitic acid and steric acid for a large number of chemical reactions. It's totally true. However, we make those molecules when we want them. 
we don't rely on our diet to obtain those. We make as much as we need whenever we want. Those things do also have a thing called arachidonic acid. And the tough thing about that is that it's a precursor to pro-inflammatory chemicals. So arachidonic acid makes straight into things that drive inflammation. And it's not even animal food per se, it's more so animal fats that contain the high amounts of arachidonic acid. So leaner animal foods are less of an issue that way. And that, and that was just, this was just a study looking at the populations, but yeah, those that consume the most of these foods had the biggest rises of thyroid antibodies. Next up, we saw processed meats, you know, probably a lot of overlap here. These things are also pretty high in iodine as are dairy products and as is commercial bread. And liquor, that's just how they termed it. I probably would have said it in a different way. Um, in, the in the diet, I did put alcoholic beverages as yellow light foods and red light foods for some. And it's not because of iodine. There's actually a lot of data showing that alcohol itself can be a driver of thyroid disease and pro-inflammatory for thyroid function. So yeah, that can be a negative. Uh, so then we think about, a point I wanted to cover quickly is that there's, there's these anti-nutrients. And in most cases, if someone is not already eating a lot of plant foods, if there's particular foods that one can't digest or tolerate, so be it. But there's been a lot of talk about anti-nutrients and these things possibly being bad. Well, most of these things really have large benefits to our health in the context of normal diets. So fibers are anti-nutrients. They're not absorbable. They help us regulate our blood sugar. Glucosinolates, uh, cut a cancer risk. This is the broccoli extract. Lectins, lots of data about lectins lowering cardiovascular disease, diabetes, diabetes, obesity, and cancers. Phytic acid, um, this is solanine from nightshades. As a quick generalization for anti-nutrients, these are all things that if they were purified from plants and consumed in quantities outside of what you would get from your diet, they definitely can be harmful. They definitely could be toxic. However, in the context of plant foods and in the way we normally prepare foods, you know, like we, we cook our beans, we don't have, we don't make raw kidney bean salads for valid reasons. We figured that out a long time ago. So yeah, in the context of how we actually cook and prepare foods and in the quantities these are found in foods, these are more health promoting than health harmful. And this is a concept called hormesis. You know, whenever you hear about phytonutrients, I want you to plant something in your head. I want you to hear the word phytotoxins because phytonutrients are actually toxins. Um, plants have, you know, good macronutrients we need. They have good vitamins and minerals. But then all those phytonutrients, they're not there because the plant's trying to help us. They're there because the plant's trying to protect itself. Those are all secondary chemical defenses. They're naturally made pesticides and herbicides and fungicides. And by a dint of our evolutionary time and adaptation to these plants, the little bit of toxins in those ends up being useful for us. You know, our body gets exposed to those things, like, like the glucosinolates from broccoli. Our liver gets exposed to that, and it realizes, hey, it's a tough world out there. I better toughen up. I better get strong and ready. And it does. And it can more effectively metabolize our hormones and break down waste and toxins because we're exposed to a milder toxin called glucosinolate from broccoli. So yeah, all these anti-nutrients, again, in massive amounts outside of the context of a diet, they would be harmful. But in the context of plant foods that we consume, they are things that are beneficial for us. So yeah, so big point is getting a variety of those plant foods. And safe uses of those, here's some examples. So yeah, there are, there are anti-nutrients in some of these beans. Well, you cook them. <laughs> we cook our beans. We've done that for a long time. We have these in some, some foods that are less common, you know, bamboo or cassava. So same thing, they've got to be processed properly. Uh, bitter apricot seed. <laughs> I ate a bunch of those one time as a mistake when I was in medical school. Yeah, I was really, I, I could, our clinic was on the second floor and the next day I could barely get up the stairs. I was, I was so sick. They, they have a version of cyanide. It could have been bad. It was pretty stupid, but I've learned those things firsthand. Uh, flaxseed, the amounts we consume, they're cooked. Use normally, they're fine. Potatoes, you don't eat the green parts. You don't eat the sprouts. <laughs> that's, that's just, we don't do that. So yeah, we've worked out ways to get around most of these things. So here's a quick synopsis about the plants that you'd wish to include. Uh, vegetables, 
Think about the leafy greens, the alliums, which are the uh, garlic and onions and shallots, root veggies, cruciferous, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, APACA. This is a cool category. This includes parsnips and parsley and celery and carrots, but all good foods, uh, the legumes, the whole grains, the nuts, the seeds. A little bit more detail here. So fruits, think too about working in some berries, citrus, stone fruit, tropical fruits, melons on occasion, and legumes, you know, a big category with a lot of benefits. So uh, there's different ones. I always used to say beans and legumes. That's not, a botanist would laugh about that <laughs> because legumes include beans and peas. They're all in the same category. So legumes covers all that. Now I know, but yeah, chickpeas, uh, various beans, if you haven't tried adzuki beans, they're one of my favorites. They're really good. They're tiny red beans. They cook up fast. They're amongst the highest dietary source of magnesium you can find, and they go well with so many dishes. Uh, peas, lentils, which are distinct, all good things. And nuts and seeds, you know, lots of good benefits here as well for all the types. So action steps, try to work in each of those categories here. These are all the things that lower the thyroid antibodies and then reduce or avoid these. These are the things that really do drive that. Now, if there are foods that you are allergic to, you're sensitive to, you respect that, you know, do avoid those. If there's things you eat and make you feel bad. If there are foods that a blood test said you were at an IgG reaction to, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> Most of those tests are not very accurate to be, truth, to be truthful. So do just push back and think about it. If there are things, if you've gotten to where you don't tolerate many of these foods, that can happen paradoxically if your diet is too limited. So the more foods you cut out, the fewer foods you become able to digest. And a lot of people find that they've been so strict for so long, they can't tolerate much of anything anymore. And that's really tragic. I'm seeing some hands go up. Yeah, um, I, it's, it's a sad thing. And I've seen really extreme versions of that where people can only eat like one or two foods. The solution for that is to take little tiny baby steps really gradually out of that. And then also to have a little, a little res patience about the process. Um, I've seen many do well with legumes, for example, to do like a teaspoon of lentils, a teaspoon of cooked lentils once a day, every other day, and play with that for a couple of weeks. And once your flora starts to adapt and adjust again, add in a little more and gradually work up but you can reverse that intolerance process in so many cases. So yeah, so I would choose one thing in a category and get one thing in a category down well, and then gradually expand upon that. You know, gradually include more food items and more quantities, and ideally get to where you've got some pretty good diversity back again. And it's easier said than done, right? What I just described, that might take even a few years, but it's worth it. You know, it's so worth it to have healthy flora back and better tolerance and a good range of foods in the diet. So please do just take steps to reverse those sorts of things if they're there. And big picture, so the diet for thyroid antibodies, uh, the iodine, a uh, crazy easy thing, the green light foods. And if anyone doesn't have the book, I'll give you an overview of that. So the foods that are highest in iodine are gonna be bread, uh, basically baked grain stuff from the store, you know, packaged bread stuff from the store. Uh, breads, bagels, rolls, croissants, muffins, cookies, all of that. And the funny thing is it's not the whole grains. It's not the flour. It's some stuff that goes on behind the scenes in the processing. And it's not even clearly represented on the labels. They've done assays of products. And some things are labeled with iodized dough conditioners or IO dates or whatnot, but they're not the only ones that are high in iodine. So one more reason to hate on processed foods is it doesn't all go on the label. There are things that are used that are not, as long as the labels are, and as bad as the ingredients are, that's not all there is in highly processed foods. So yeah, so leave the processed grains behind. That's the big first one. Um, ocean products, so sea vegetables, better to avoid for thyroid disease. And then seafood, some types are lower than others. I mentioned squid as one cool option. A lot of freshwater fish is good too. Many other good options in the book. Uh, dairy products. Uh, non-dairy products are really not an issue with the exception of those that have carrageenan. And I see a lot fewer products with that nowadays, but still want to look out for it. So yeah, during the active reset phase, avoid the dairy foods. A lot of those that are contaminated with iodine. 
egg yolks, not a factor for egg whites at all, but egg yolks have a fair amount, and then salt. You want to use low iodine versions of salt, uh, kosher salt, um, and then also uh, uh, kosher salts for cooking. I like Malden's brand sea salt and then Celtic brand light gray salt. And by like, I mean, they've got low iodine on their assays. <laughs> That's all. That's the only reason I have a preference that way. So yeah, focus on the green light foods. And once you've gotten stable and corrected, add in some yellow light foods, you know, spend those Chuck E. Cheese tickets. <laughs> Next thing is balancing fuel. If your height to waist ratio is more than a half. So if you're half as wide around circumference, your belly button as you are tall, there's probably some excess fuel making those inflammatory chemicals. And just look at the metabolism reset process. You know, two protein-based shakes, one good meal in the evening, snacks on veggies, and focus on the green light foods for that. And then the last step is your plant foods. You know, really getting all those categories worked in. You want the, the veggies, the fruits, some whole grains, some legumes, some nuts and seeds. So covering all the bases on those plant food categories. And again, there's countless other things that have been talked about as far as dietary factors for thyroid disease. But honestly, a lot of things can work even if they don't work. So what I mean by that is you may do something that helps, but not, but it didn't help why they thought it did. So many, for example, that have gone, uh, that have cut certain foods out, they got better because they lowered their iodine or they got better because they were eating less food and they lost weight and that was good. But these are the core biggest drivers as far as dietary factors in your antibodies is your iodine, your overall fuel balance, and then these categories of plant foods. So that's, that's our big ones. Let's see where I'm at. I am on time. Um, do these little lines show up for you guys too? Or is it just me seeing those? They show up for everyone. I'm sure it was a mistake, you know, but I'll just figure out some way to turn that off somehow. I'll figure out how to use it myself and make it to you guys. You guys don't accidentally draw on there. Thankfully, no one drew anything like inappropriate or whatever. <laughs> No teenage boys in the crowd, apparently. My son would have probably done that. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that now that my picture's up there. <laughs> I'll get a mustache or something. <laughs> let, me, let me grab a few of these questions here. I see several hands up. I'll get a bunch. I'm afraid I may not be able to get all of them. Let me pull this part of the screen over in front of me. Okay. Okay, participants. Yeah. All right, so what's going to happen is I will call out your first name and I will ask you to unmute. There's a process by which you can press a button and unmute yourself, and then you will be on audio. You can just ask your question. I will, we'll have a conversation. And there's, there's, there's several here. We'll get to as many as we can. So yeah, please just think through in your head how to like a sentence with a question mark at the end and, and we'll, we'll go for it. <laughs> All right, so Lorraine, you are first up. You can set a good example for us. I'm gonna ask to unmute and lower your hand and go for it. Thank you for having this Zoom for us. Hey, Lorraine. Um, <laughs> You've been front and center on my screen the whole night where you were one of the first ones to pop up. So yeah, thanks for the, thanks for the good attention and the good nods. You've been keeping me going here. Good. <laughs> okay, I have um, a, a few questions, but the main question I'm, uh, is on my mind is, do you recommend the COVID vaccine for people with thyroid problems? Yeah, awesome question. I wrote a blog post today about that and I filmed it a couple of days oh. ago. It's coming out. Um, the quick answer is, yeah, uh, think about, people often think about, do I get a vaccine or no vaccine? And my thought is, do you get the vaccine or do you get COVID? <laughs> I think that's a more meaningful way to think of it. You okay. know, if, if someone's lucky enough to be able to be away from the world for a couple of years, they cannot worry about that but most of us, that won't apply to us. So the thought is, what's the likelihood of the vaccine driving autoimmune disease, causing it or worsening it? How does that compare to the likelihood of COVID causing or worsening autoimmune disease? And, and the other thought is that we, we have had a lot of times in which vaccines have been thought to cause autoimmunity. And the, the ones that have been looked at were those that had some version of the actual organism. They call that an attenuated virus, for example, where it's it's there, but it's kind of weak. And there's a lot of infections that can drive autoimmunity. So it's a logical thought. If the infection could give you could give you a problem, maybe the vaccine that has that infection, even if it's weaker, maybe it could do the same thing. By and large, those have not panned out as being causal. 
The difficulty with a lot of bad things on vaccines is that it's a game of large numbers. So for example, in the study that the Pfizer vaccine was done, there was 44,000 people, two groups. Everyone got a shot. Half the shots were salt water. You know, the other half were actual vaccines. No one knew which was which. As the numbers started coming out, two people died after receiving the vaccine, you know, in the weeks after receiving the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And that was an attention getter. But as time rolled on, six people died in the salt water group, in the placebo group. And yeah, so basically in America, 8,000 people die per day, just randomly. And in that study, what they saw was that people who were 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, um, well, if you watch them for a few months, sadly, somebody's going to have a heart attack or somebody's going to have a major stroke. And it's really tricky to say, if, if A followed B, did A cause B? That, that's the thing you have to unwind. Mm -hmm. And by and large, they've not seen a causal link that way. We do know that COVID has caused people to develop autoimmune disease. We know that it's caused flares of many types of autoimmune disease. But autoimmune disease has not been observed amongst those receiving the vaccine. Totally bizarre coincidence. I wrote about this today. Um, the number of people who, have, who have, are infected with COVID, as in the U.S., today's statistics, 25.6 million. Check this out. I couldn't make this up. I was writing this paper thinking, I bet there's almost that many who've got the vaccine so far. And I checked it and I looked at the numbers. So do you know how many have gotten the vaccine as of today? 25.6 million, like the oh exact same goodness. number. <laughs> how weird is that? So we've had 439,000 deaths from COVID. There have been those who have died after the vaccine, but all analysis has shown that it probably wasn't from that. It was more of a, a thing that happened, like a heart attack that was building up for some time or a suddenly discovered cancer that took decades to form and happened to occur then. So, so yeah, I think that the, the risks for someone with autoimmunity, there's a lot more risks on the side of COVID than there are in the risks of the vaccine. Okay. Um, can I ask you also a question about your personalized thyroid plan program? For sure. Is, is that done mostly on Facebook or um, because I don't do Facebook? <laughs> no, no, no worries. It's through its own portal. So all the uh -huh. content comes through a specialized portal you have access to. If you, mm -hmm. if you wish, you can jump in and chat on Facebook and hang out with those in the group and get some feedback or whatnot. But no, the content itself is not through Facebook. Mm -hmm. you, wouldn't, and, you wouldn't miss out. And uh, this, this may be somebody else's question, but, um, or you might just want to throw it out. Um, I was wondering what, about ashwagandha and probiotics if you have any uh, suggestions on those. Yeah, you know, good things. And um, I'll just, let me remute and uh, just some, th some thoughts I would put out. I, uh, there, there's basic essential micronutrients that are good to include. They're the things that we do need that we cannot get from the diet. Everything that's not on that list, I would argue you should have a good reason for it and you should have a time frame for it. I, there's a thing I've called pill creep where the pill list starts to just like creep up and get bigger and bigger and bigger. So, so yeah, nothing bad about those specifically. I did, Lorraine, I did write a really detailed post about probiotics. Um, would they be useful for you? Would they not? Which ones did you think about? So yeah, Google my name in that. And ashwagandha, I talked about that in the adrenal reset diet. There are certain stages of adrenal function where it can be good for, some in which it's less helpful for, but you can check those things out for more details. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for being here. Okay, let's grab a couple more. Um, so there's, I'm seeing how the order came up here. Alita, uh, Lita, you are up next. I'm going to ask to unmute, lower hand, and you should be able to go. Hi, thank you. Hey, Alita, um, how are you doing? Um, can someone who has had thyroid cancer and a total thyroidectomy get Hashimoto's disease? Um, awesome question. So get it. So you're saying like develop it after thyroidectomy? Yes. Not to my knowledge. Did okay. that seem to happen for you? No. And I, and I, you know, I get an annual thyroid globulin um, test for the cancer. Yeah. Uh, I have never had a TPO antibiotic uh, antibody test. And I don't know that I need one, do I? No, you don't. So with thyroid globulin, you might know this. Um, there's two blood tests that sound almost the same. There's thyroglobulin and antithyroglobulin. Antithyroglobulin is one of those two thyroid antibodies. Thyroglobulin is just a protein by itself. So thyroid cells, like all parts of the body, some wear out, they 
pop open, they die, they spill their contents in the bloodstream. And that's why there's some thyroglobulin there for those who have a thyroid. If there's a lot of thyroglobulin there, someone has an enlarged thyroid or rapidly growing thyroid cells. Now, since you had yours taken out, you wouldn't expect to see much thyroglobulin present. If there suddenly were, we'd think, hey, there's some cancer cells growing back. So that's the logic with that one. But you wouldn't be expected to develop the antibodies. Now, having said that, however, those those three steps, the, the iodine, the fuel, and the food categories, the iodine one still matters. Remember that that pump that pulls in the iodine and it shuts off the thyroid when there's a lot of iodine? That pump works outside your thyroid too. It works in your liver, your kidneys, and your other cells. So when there's extra iodine in your system, your body gets thyroid hormone resistant. And even if you're taking what you might need, you can't use it as well as you would otherwise. So that step can still be very relevant for you. So I would still want low um, iodine levels. That's right. But I won't possibly get Hashimoto's disease. Nope. Your risks of Hashimoto's disease are exactly as high as my risks are of getting pregnant. <laughs> That's <cool. laughs> I just don't have those parts. You don't have those parts. <laughs> We're good. Yeah, thank you so much for the seminar. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I'm going to remute. Okay. Um, lower your hand. There we go. Ah, Kitty. Uh, let's see. There we go. Kitty, you are up. I'm going to ask to unmute, lower your hand, and let's hear what you got for me. Hi, I have, Dr. C. It's good to hear you. I've been listening the last few days and learned more than I thought. I, I didn't know I didn't know. <laughs> but Even with I all have, those books behind you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All of your books too. Uh, I've been reading the, the current one and um, I had a, one observation and I have a couple questions. One thing that I did find uh, on canned beans where it said no salt added and I thought, oh great, I'll get these. And it was at Natural Grocers and instead of salt, they had added seaweed. So we really need to watch the labels. Um, and then I had a question. I know you've in the past, you've advised to take your blood test without taking your thyroid meds. Does that affect the antibodies as well? Truth be told, it actually doesn't affect the antibodies. It mostly affects the free T3 and free T4. That's the biggest factor that way. And you do that so to see whether you remain on the medicine or whether you can take the medicine less of it? Well, yeah, you're, you're testing to, to see how it might change. A lot of people, they need less and you wanna know that right away because otherwise you'd be taking too much. And also it would make your thyroid unable to repair. If you get more than you need, your TSH goes below range and that's bad onto itself, but also that's your, you want your thyroid a little bit stimulated. You want it to be still in the game. And if there's no stimulation on it, it has no chance to really grow or heal. You're gradually going towards the low end of the TSH. Should you be looking at reducing? Yeah, and that's something that's a, always a conversation with your prescriber. If you're below range, definitely. If you're rapidly lowering, you might take that step preemptively. But for sure, that, that's the general idea. So I work with the office, so I should maybe contact them? Yeah, please, please remeasure within a month of starting. And then, yeah, just get a follow-up and see where things are. Okay. And then with in your book, I just wonder where crackers and gluten-free bread fall and how does hard candy have thyroid, uh, you know, iodine in it? You know, that's a great question. And there's, there's some things that are just general principles. Like we know there's a lot of it in seaweed, for example. And there's some things, so you'll never see a good iodine list online because it's, it's, it's just not, it's not readily available data. I, I worked my butt off for years to find 600 foods and about like 50 readings for each food and I average them all out. And in most cases, you could predict iodine based on a food category. But there was a few things that were complete outliers. So candy was one. There are some food colorings that are high in iodine. You know, FD&C number five is one example. It's a red coloring. But there are some foods that we're like, why was that there? You know, so I've had examples <laughs> that I have no clue why it was present. Um, frozen cantaloupe. There was one assay of frozen cantaloupe that was through the roof. Uh, prune juice. I have no idea why that's high in iodine, but it often is. But yeah, so I don't know, but it was. <laughs> okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Let's get a couple more here. I'm going to remute. And Maggie, uh, Maggie's up. I'm going to ask to unmute. 
lower hand and go for it. Hi, thank you. Um, I just wanted to know, I was surprised to see that you had dark poultry as well as fatty meats on your list to avoid. Um, are you talking like chicken thighs and turkey legs and that sort of thing? Because fatty foods offer so much flavor and I was just, you know, it's kind of been our staple. I'm wondering now if it's a problem. <laughs> they sure are tasty. You know, fat molecules carry flavor themselves. That's the joke from every state fair is you can deep fry a boot and it would taste good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but but yeah, that, that's just how it played out in the Dalmatian studies that high fatty things were drivers of thyroid antibodies. So then the how, do you, is that flavor the, how tastes, do you flavor the, the lean meats then? Well, I was going to say our, our tastes calibrate for sugar, fat, and salt. What I mean by that is we get used to a certain amount. So if you do go on leaner meats, for a while, they will taste less flavorful, but within a couple of days, your taste buds do recalibrate. So your, your body can adjust to that. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome, good question. Okay, uh, Non, uh, asking to unmute and lower your hand and go for it. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I think I may have missed the very beginning because I was driving home from work, but. I just have a couple of questions. One, the iodine, we were always taught to have iodine foods to avoid thyroid issues. So if yeah. you have hypothyroidism, I totally missed your concept because I hear you saying decrease your iodine. Mm -hmm. So are we decreasing and trying to limit iodine if we have hypothyroidism? Yeah, so what happens is that, and I'm pulling up an article, I'll give you a link to this one. What happens is that in the modern world, uh, since about the mid 90s, we started getting too much. There were parts of the world that were severely iodine deficient, but as of 2014, there were no more. And we now have 52 nations that are categorized as being at risk for thyroid disease due to iodine excess. Um, there's a lot in the chat, but I'm going to drop a link in the chat if that shows up. Or if it's hard to find there, if you just Google my name and iodine controversy, it'll tell you all about why there's different views on that. But I did cite that data pretty well in the book too. And, and that, that was correct. It was too much as a problem for those that are prone to thyroid disease. Um, if you're you drinking right. reverse osmosis water through a filtration system, some of very, very uh, many minerals are removed. You're supposed to add additional minerals to each gallon, which hasn't gone too well in my family. They don't like that taste. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I honestly we... wouldn't worry about that practice. I, I have heard that said, but we don't really, mineral, water is not where we get our minerals from. We get it more so from our diet. So from yeah, just, just have, you know, some, some minerals can taste nice. And some areas that happen to have minerals in the water, you can absorb some magnesium from that, but water won't take minerals from your body. So I've heard some argue that unless you add them in, water pulls it out. Just doesn't work that way with water in the kidneys and whatnot. So yeah, if you like it for flavor, add it. Otherwise, purified water is great and then have a lot of mineral-rich foods in the diet. And some speakers have actually in thyroid realms have said, if you are a vegan or a vegetarian, you're at a disadvantage. I noticed you did put in several types of animal products and meats. If we're a family is vegan and vegetarian, are we at a very big disadvantage? So the study that I cited, um, the animal products and meats, the fatty animal products were things right. that elevated thyroid antibodies. Those are things that had negative effects. So, so no, vegans are avoiding those products already. So that would not be a disadvantage. Okay. And do I have time for two quick questions? And you can just give me the shortest answer possible. How about one quick one? Okay. If there's hair loss, but your labs are normal and there are no antibodies, could it be related to thyroid disease? Um, normal, but in, in some, sometimes, and I'm gonna give you a link here for another paper to look at. Um, here we go. Yeah, here was a deep dive I wrote. Um, and again, I don't know if the chat is too full to easily find things in, but I'll put this in Anyway, let me get back to that. Um, a little tricky to find. There, it, there we go. Okay, chat and boom. Yeah, uh, thyroid levels certainly can affect hair loss. As a generalization, they're not the, 
They're not the only thing, and they tend to be a larger factor when they're off by large amounts. There's not a lot of data on thyroid antibodies alone affecting here, but the TSH, the free hormones, when they're off by large functions, they can. I think a lot about iron, cortisol, androgenic hormones. They're often bigger factors for many people. Okay. Uh, Kathleen, I'm asked to unmute, lower hand, and let's see what you have for us. Um, I had, I put some stuff in the chat and I just wanted to ask, I didn't get the beginning of the thing. So I wanted to ask, um, one of the, one of the natural practitioners that I, uh, have watched mentioned that there's a connection with liver function and, um, uh, thyroid, um, um, hormones, the different things that affect the thyroid. So yeah. I just wondered if you could if you could talk about that a little bit. I sure will. Thank you for that. So that really goes back to that second point that I mentioned about the fuel overload. And thank you for bringing that up. I didn't go into that part of it. The main one of the main ways that excess fuel hurts us is that it changes liver function. You know, our liver has to process our hormones, the environmental wastes, our nutrients, let's keep those things right. The biggest stressor that it does is it stores fuel. So it's storing triglycerides and glycogen. And the problem is that you saw how all those things could make triglycerides. Well, you can make triglycerides even when there's no more space for them. You can kind of like, like build on a new wing, so to speak. And that's fatty liver disease. And it's an overt disease, but before it's that bad, there's a whole continuum. And in most cases, when someone has that waist to height ratio changing, they're getting early fatty liver. And that's driving many inflammatory chemicals, including those that elevate thyroid antibodies. So yeah, it's just right back to that same fuel discussion, but very important point. Thank you for that. Hey, mom's back. I think I saw mom here recently. <laughs> Unless we got a different one, that could be too. So mom, go ahead. Perhaps she raised her hand and stepped out or can't quite find the mic. I will, okay, let's go to Burn. Uh, B-E-R-N, Burn, I'm gonna ask to unmute and go ahead. Hi, Dr. C, how are you? Hey, I'm doing great, how about yourself? Yeah, um, you know what, I just have a question because I'm really trying my very best to maybe just try uh, healing my thyroid. I have a Hashimoto for maybe almost 14 years now. Okay. And I'm really trying to get off the medication. Is that something that it's possible for anyone? I mean, I actually, it's interesting that I come across with your email and I just have a concern with my doctor because my TSH just went up to 104 which the range is 0.27 to 4.2. Yeah. So I actually just had another blood work today because she wanted to see why it just like spiked up or something like that. But yeah. is it possible to get off medication? Because, I mean, I'm trying my best and good I'm question. working on it for all those years. Yeah, good question. Thank you for that. Um, that's actually another paper I've got coming out pretty soon is just exactly answering that question. There was a study that came out in the last couple of weeks and kind of surprised me. Now, you guys, I'm going to tell you this. So no one do anything irresponsible. Pro cross your heart and promise me no one does anything irresponsible. Okay, I saw some hearts being crossed. Thank you for that. <laughs> so in the study, they had people who had been on thyroid medication for many years and they watched them after withdrawal. They had them stop and they watched how their levels played out blew me away, 37% maintained normal thyroid function. So many people can. Now, yeah, I saw some shock looks, 37%. It's shocked me too. Now, what they did see, they differentiated those who had overt hypothyroidism. And the way they defined that was a TSH more than, more than 12 plus free T4 levels well below range. So some people had that they didn't do as well. They weren't the ones that could go off as easily. Others had what was called subclinical hypothyroidism. That means a TSH that's higher with or without antibodies, but the T4 was not yet below range. 
those were more so the ones that could go without. Now, we heard from someone earlier who had her thyroid removed. She wouldn't be in that category, obviously, uh, but many people can. And the study that I cited earlier was that 78% got full-on better function deliberately. So this 37% study, that wasn't doing anything deliberate. That was just randomly stopping and being okay. So I do think that, especially if someone does the deliberate steps that have been shown to reverse thyroid disease, that's, that's a very realistic outcome. So yeah. And one more thing I would say too, for those to whom that's not likely, I'm going to turn the lights on. The sun's getting darker out here. Now I'm not hiding in the dark anymore. So those for whom that that's not likely, I wouldn't, I wouldn't despair. You know, the, there, there's the idea of being on the medication and, and I, I, I hate the idea of being stuck on something. I get that. But focus on feeling your best and functioning your best. Make that the top priority. And if you do the things that achieve that, it may get better, it may improve, and, and that's cool. As a generalization, a good doctor should support you in that journey. And if you're doing things like the reset diet and you're on a dose of medicine, but now you need less, there are ways to gently lower and work with your system to help you facilitate that. So, so yeah, that's a, that's a plausible goal for many, more so than I thought. But stay tuned, more to come on that. All right, let me grab a couple more here. Um, Regina, <laughs> Regina, let's have you speak up. What have you got for yes. us tonight? Yes, question. I'm going to lower my hand. Did I lower my hand? I can't see my, I can't see my, my, my window. I, I lowered your hand. Oh, thank you. Okay, <laughs> Dr. Dr. Christensen, thank you for asking me. Two questions, actually three. Is rice, does rice, white rice contain iodine? Is that advisable? Is that okay to take or is that something? Yeah, so the book's got really thorough lists of green, yellow, red light foods. Yeah, rice is green light. Excellent. What about, you mentioned prune juice contains iodine. What about dried prunes? Um, not, not as much. They're actually yellow light, but also, also easy ones in the book. Cool. And I think you just mentioned that iodine causes TSH resistance, yes. which in return makes the antibodies high, higher levels of antibodies. Yep, you got it. So that's it, right? Yep. I'm treating with a functional medicine practitioner here in New York City. Uh -huh. So um, I, will, I want to ask him uh, about iodine. Uh, I don't know, do you know Dr. Borenstein? I do. You know him? I've, I've not met him personally, but I know of his work quite extensively. He is, he said he's been doing it for years and years. Yeah. So. Yeah, please, there's an article that I posted about the iodine controversy. I talked quite a bit about his work and why our views differ. I wrote about that in that article. Oh, would you mind giving me an email link here in the, in the chat? If you take a look in the chat, I don't know if you can see the ones from me. If you can't, just put in Alan Christensen, iodine controversy. And you'll find it quite easily. Okay, one sec. Let me write it down. Iodine controversy. Yeah. That's an easy, easy one to find. Yeah, the funny thing is that Dr. Bornstein and myself were both trained by a gentleman named Guy Abrams, who has since deceased. Dear man, kind man. And the whole idea about needing high-dose iodine was his brainchild. The difference between Brownstein and myself was just that, you know, I read... I read the references, I read the other studies, and I just, uh, I saw that the research was going in a different direction. But yep, there are those that have some older views still. Okay, uh, Alice, let's hear you. You've been patiently waiting here for a bit. How are you doing this evening? I'm great. Thank you so much for, I'm so thrilled to get to ask you something. <laughs> I've been on the pro, I've been on the program for some time and, um, and just got my lab results back and my TSH has gone down quite a bit. So awesome. it's down. Yay. So it's working. Um, <laughs> I was at like 0.97 or something before, and now I'm at 0.243. Yeah. And unfortunately I'm on NP thyroid cause that's all I can find. And the next jump down is a big jump. It's just 60 milligrams. I'm at 90 now. Is okay. that big a jump? You know, a couple of thoughts that that could be a larger step um, as a generalization, when your TSH does get to be below range, but it's not flattened. So flattened like 0.001 as low as it can get. Yeah, when it's below range, but not all the way down, your 
you are above, but probably not by a huge amount. So I'm thinking about this the same way you are. Uh, in our practice, what we often do is we'll use NP and we'll use the quarter grain potencies. They're also called 15 milligram potencies. Right. We use those to fill in for cases like that. So, so yeah, when we would see someone like in a situation like yours, rather than go from 90 to 60, we could do a 60 plus a 15. So it's like more gentle step down. Right. I just have to have two prescriptions, sadly. It does take two prescriptions, two pills to take at once. But but yeah, that's that's probably the smoothest transition for you. That's what I was thinking I needed to do. I'm so happy to ask you these things. And I'm, thank you so much. I've so appreciated the support. And I really encourage anybody who's thinking about it to do the program. And, and the Facebook groups are really helpful. And a subject came up in the group today um, about um, CC foods that contains canned foods or prepared foods that have sea salt, because there are a number of like uh, dairy alternatives that you say are okay that do have sea salt. Clearly yeah. you assayed them, but is, is there, and somebody said you, they had heard you say that if it had 500 milligrams or less of, of, of sodium, then it was safe. Cause there's so many things that have sea salt, but maybe their levels aren't so high. Yeah. What's, how should we look at that? Because it's it's hard if you're... Yeah. It is. There's a lot of foods that are made with that. And you're, you're exactly right. And I base that just on all the products that I have seen assayed. So if it's something to where there's sea salt, but it's also something that's got a major obvious source of iodine, like the egg yolks or dairy, that's different. Right. But if there's right. no obvious iodine sources, but there's some sea salt somewhere down the ingredient list, and the total sodium contribution is under 500 milligrams, I would consider that green light. That would be negligible. Is that per serving you're considering? Per serving, correct. Okay, so a lot of things like beans and tomatoes and whatever might be okay. If yeah, we, that opens up a lot of more, lot more options. It really opens up a lot. And I guess sort of on that same thing, for someone who grew up on the coast and clams and crabs and loves and loves oysters almost more <laughs> than anything, Am I never going to be able to have those things? If I do that, am I then really setting myself back so, if I indulge in any of these things once I Alice, get, it's Chuck, it's Chuck E. Cheese. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how many oysters I can eat. Just, <laughs> no, and, and I'm really with you on this. I if I had a magic wand, I would have put all the iodine in like junk food and say, just don't eat junk food. That'd be simple. Um, mollusks and oysters, they're really good foods for so many reasons. So it breaks my heart that some version of seafood are so high. But yeah, hold on to those for the yellow light options when you get to the maintenance phase. <laughs> all right, one quick other, th I, mean, I don't know if this is going to be quick, but the gluten, There's there's been so much. I know I just saw your interview with Dr. Tom O'Brien, who I've followed for a long time. Yeah. And he talks a lot about molecular mimicry and that being an issue with, with Hashimoto's. And then there's Dr. Faisano and the whole issue of zonulin and tight yeah. junctions and leaky gut. And I haven't heard you talk about that. I've heard you talk about you need your whole grains. I can get my whole grains, but I'm I'm concerned about these other and, and gluten causing micro tears in the intestines. So what's your what's your take on those? positions about gluten. Yeah. So the zonulin and the micro traumas, these are real things that show up in celiac disease. There are plenty of citations on that. And those without celiac disease, so leaky gut's a funny thing. There's actually a really good podcast that I did with Tamara Duker for human. And I'm trying to think of the title of that one, but it hurt Tamara, my, my podcast in Tamara. So okay. we went very deep in the whole leaky gut idea. The okay. earliest iteration of that, which came out in the late nineties was that the, the gut membranes open up in response to trauma, bad things get in, trigger the immune system, autoimmunity, da 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 da. It was a plausible theory for a while. However, it's fallen out of favor amongst research. What really? we now know is that you can't diagnose someone with leaky gut any more than you can diagnose someone with height. You know, it's, it's normal to have permeability and it's normal for that to change. Your body adjusts that. And what happens is when there's some kind of a trauma occurring, the gut makes itself more permeable to pull in immune cells and pull in nutrients. So the old thought was that leaky gut, that leaky gut happened for some reason, and then that caused disease. The new idea is disease happens and the body changes permeability as an adaptation. 
And there's quite a few lines of evidence that have refuted the older model. So there's much still being determined, but that earlier older model of that has just not stood the test of time. So yeah, good question. That that's that's fat because I was a bread maker and a biscuit maker and a, I've it's been although biscuits without buttermilk that's not going to work. So <laughs> um, at any rate, I the I the idea of being able to possibly have because I've been gluten free for maybe five or six years and it's hard. Well, one one more quick final thought about that, Alice. And I've heard I've, I've heard many many people to where they've gone on, you know, good sourdough breads, had no issue. There are some to where if you've not eaten something for a long time, your body's just not used to it and you want to give time to reintroduce. But there was a big study done in Italy on those that had celiac and they were given traditionally made sourdough breads, pretty massive amounts and no measurable effects upon their disease process. So sourdoughs are different. And then in terms of iodine, the things you would make at home, Alice, are completely different. It's you can use flours, you can bake things, you can use whole grains. It's not at all the same as far as the commercial products are for the iodine. So phase some things back in. Now, one more, a couple more thoughts. If you're eating a certain amount of food that's working out well for you and you add something on top of that, now you got more food than you're used to, more, might be more food than you need. So it's always about then adapting and changing and making room for that. But, but yeah, whole grains are a part of the healthy diet. Let me grab a couple more here. Um, I just saw, I'm not seeing many of the chat, but I saw one on the permeability. I'm going to go back in the chat and Tamara Duker. I'm going to spell this wrong. My apologies in advance to her, but I think I'm pretty close. And then medical myths, legends, and my last name. And you'll definitely find that. Here we go. Okay, let's get a couple more. Uh, Bonnie. Asked to unmute lower hand, go for it, Bonnie. Um, quick, quick check-in. My first plan was uh, 30 minutes. I'm gonna roll for another 20 minutes or so and get through what I can. So let, let's keep going. So Bonnie, what have you got? Yes, um, hi, thank you so much for hosting this. I really appreciate it. I've learned a lot. Good, good. Um, now, I... I am also gluten-free and, you know, I was under the misconception that gluten-free does help lower thyroid antibodies because um, I actually, I, I did decide to do gluten-free and had tested my levels and um, my levels did go down. My TSH levels went down. And so I, I mean, I have never been tested for celiac disease, but um, do you think I should be? Definitely test for celiac, you know, a couple more thoughts. So many people, when they go gluten-free, they, they chop out a lot of iodine from their diet because that's, that's the, in the last few decades, the things that have changed for iodine have been commercial bread products and dairy. Those are the two biggest things that have changed the most. So yeah, many, many people go gluten-free and they plummet their iodine and they can get better for that reason. The controlled tests in which iodine was kept constant showed that gluten wasn't the variable, but iodine often was, and it's there with it. Now, the other thing is we talked about fuel being the number two driver. A lot of folks like we're talking with Alice, I said, well, if you take your diet and add gluten on top of it, you'll get too much food. So you got to make room. The other hand, if you don't change your diet and take a big thing out of it, now you're eating less food and people can often lose weight for that reason. And that's a huge driver of thyroid antibodies. So for sure, if you're lowering your iodine, dropping some pounds, that can help. And again, if you're doing better without gluten, I'm not the gluten guy. I have, I have no agenda of pushing gluten on anyone at all. But when someone says, hey, do I need to do this? This is tough. I'm like, well, I don't see reasons why you need to do that part of it. So yeah, good question. Okay, Lorraine, let's hear what you got, Lorraine, go ahead. Lorraine, are you off in the other room? We're waiting for you. <laughs> okay, let me remute and we'll see if Susan's here and paying attention. <laughs> All right, Susan, go ahead. Okay, we're going fast. <laughs> Let's see, let me remute. Seeing a lot of folks being really patient here. Um, let me go down slightly. Ah, that doesn't work. Okay, Renee, how about Renee? Um, I asked to unmute. 
I'm mm-hmm. here. Can you hear me? I sure can. How you doing? I'm doing really good. Um, just a quick question. I'm wondering, do all of these things apply to Graves' disease as well? Yeah, yeah. Good question. So all of them, the iodine, yes. The fuel balance, yes. The food, the food study, partially. And I say partially because many with Graves do have positive thyroid peroxidase antibodies. A smaller percent have positive thyroglobulin antibodies. But, but the iodine thing, definitely. And yeah, the total, the, the fuel, definitely. Uh, with Graves, there's a vicious cycle between having too much thyroid hormone and then the autoimmunity that makes you have too much thyroid hormone. So it does take some therapy to slow the thyroid to break the cycle. But if that's done in conjunction with iodine regulation, it's going to go a whole lot quicker and you'll, you can recover faster too. I'm okay. going to remute. Funny thing about Graves is that it's, it's more acutely dangerous, but there's a higher rate of spontaneous remission. So if you're managed well for Graves and you do the right things, there have been papers, I've seen different numbers, but I've seen numbers between about like 80 to 95% can go into full remission in a year and a half to two years. So it's a big deal. You need to manage it, but there's a really good chance of it being fine on its own when things are done right. All right, Rachel, let's hear you. I'm going to ask to unmute and lower hand and go ahead. Uh, I, is this my I can hear right someone now. speaking. I'm guessing it's Rachel. Hi. Hey there. Thank you so much, Dr. Christensen. This was fascinating, and I really just learned about you and bought your book. Oh, awesome. Welcome. Thank you. I'm somewhat new to this. Um, I, I was diagnosed with high antibodies in the last couple of years, uh, really in just the last six months, and then everything just plummeted in the last three weeks. And I've got a TSH of 174 and T3 and T4 of, you know, 0.1 and 0.3. Okay. Um, So I have a general practitioner that just gave me 0.75 of Synthroid. Am I on the right track? Should I be cutting out iodine? I'd rather not be on any medication, but I feel terrible. Oh yeah. You know, that's a big deal. Uh, This is, that's severe hypothyroidism. And in the past, that, yeah, I won't go into all the complications that could cause from that, but it's a big deal. You need treatment for sure. And it may be the case that you'll respond better and that things could bounce back. Things might improve. Definitely the low iodine that'll help. Um, generalization, where you were, your, your thyroid is pretty much kaput. It was making not much of anything to put some context on that. Uh, as a rule of thumb, you're a woman who's menstruating or who is on hormones the body makes about one microgram of T4 per pound of body weight per day. If a woman is not menstruating, postmenopause and not on hormones, that number is a little bit lower. But yeah, quick rule of thumb, about a microgram of something like Synthroid per pound of body weight per day. So for most people, 75 would be a pretty small amount when your thyroid's totally shut down. If someone were 75 pounds, that might be exactly what they need. That'd be pretty small for most adults. So when you're, when you're that low, most doctors start you on what's a, called just a, a full physiologic replacement dose. You know, I'm, I'm right around 165, 170. If I had blood scores like you, well, I wouldn't be my own doctor, but if, <laughs> but if I was, I'd prescribe myself about 170 micrograms out of the gate because I won't need too much less than that. So, so that should I'm, give you a- I'm about 102. Okay. And prescribed me with 0.88. But since yeah. I do think I'm my own doctor, which I'm not, I ask you to start <laughs> me lower. Please, please retest promptly. The odds are pretty high you'll need more than that in the short term, at I least. I just go back to the 0.88 because I've got them both. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, please, please connect with your doctor. But just again, when you're, when you're that shut down, it's about a microgram per pound of body weight. And those who are listening who are on natural thyroid, uh, 100 micrograms of T4 is about the same as one grain of natural thyroid. So yeah, you probably need more. The lowering iodine may help you recover more quickly and you may see some better benefits to symptoms faster. It'll be still be a good thing. But, but yeah, I would definitely continue with treatment for you in the meantime. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Glad you were here. Glad we could answer that one. Uh, Estella, pretty name, Estella. Let's hear your question. Hi, can you hear me? I sure can. How you doing? Good, good. Um, 
Yeah, no, this is really um, helpful. I'm actually, uh, I've been working with Parsley Health and they put me on a low iodine diet. I'm still trying to figure things out, um, but I've noticed that I haven't been able to take um, a lot of the, uh, the, thi the anti-thyroids for Graves because um, it was affecting my liver. I think my liver was already congested, um, but I, over the last week or so, I've noticed that um, my eyes have been affected again. And I'm wondering if, if you know what can help with that. Yeah, um, yeah great question. Doing the low iodine, um, you know, vegan and super healthy on the diet overall. I've lost a lot, like 20 pounds in the last six months. So, yeah. Yeah, Graves, Graves eye disease. I'm going to remute and mention that. You know, something else that's an option for, for you all. Um, I practiced 25 years and I always enjoy patient care. I started doing something new that allows me to work as a consultant for people. It doesn't matter what state you're in, what country you're in even. I can act as a consultant as you wish. I don't act as a prescriber in that context, but I can look over labs, talk through symptoms, and really help give you a good game plan that a local doctor can help you implement. So for that, that's at thyroidopinion.com. I'm just gonna put that in chat as well real quick here. www.thyroidopinion.com. Odd for some reason. Okay, <laughs> thyroidopinion.com. And yeah, I can help guide people and talk through particular situations as well. So Graves eye disease is correlated, of course, with Graves disease. However, it's not perfectly correlated with the hyperthyroidism. So even when you manage the thyroid levels, Graves eye disease still can show up. It affects about a quarter of people with Graves disease, and it does relate to the autoimmune process more than the absolute thyroid levels. So the iodine steps are very helpful. It's something to where it does change over slower periods of time, like about like a three to six month period of time. So do still pursue that, but with symptoms of that, do also consult with an ophthalmologist. You know, do be sure to get a good examination. Sometimes there are things they can detect or do to prevent that from progressing if it's showing up. But overall, the, the, the strongest correlation is with thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin that's the immune marker that drives Graves. That's the strongest thing that predicts Graves' eye disease. Now, when you can't tolerate thyroid blockers, that's, that's a little difficult because you've got to get out of that hyperthyroid state for the TSI to come down as well. There are natural thyroid blockers that some can do better with. They're not non-prescription. My doctors do use those. I can consult on those and I could give guidance that those at Parsley Health could help manage as well. So that's an option for you, but yeah, important thing. And I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, let's get a couple more. Okay, so I'm 52 years old and I love seeing names that I haven't seen before <laughs> and I want to pronounce them well. Um, let's see, hmm. S-C-H-Y-L-E, Sysheen, Sysheen, huh? Sysleen? Okay. I'm going to have you help me. I hope I didn't butcher it too badly, but let's hear your question and please help me pronounce your name better. Great. It's Shalene. Shalene. Well, that's so much easier. I <laughs> well, it sounds easy. I don't know. I was, struggling, I was struggling for no reason. I don't know why my mother had me spelled it where she did, but at any rate, <laughs> um, thank you so much, Dr. Christensen. I followed you for many, many years. So my question, um, one of my questions, I know it's really simple, but what is a hundred micrograms? Can I get an idea of what that is in terms of salt or or food with, with iodine in it? A hundred micrograms. Do you mean what I was talking about before about the per pound of body weight or? Well, did you say that a hundred micrograms should be what, how the amount of iodine we should, that's safe to take in a day? Or am I, did I misunderstand that? The most recent thing I was talking about was like doses of thyroid medication, but I'll still answer this question. Okay. So it's, it's probably about 50 to 200 is a safe range for staying even. And then below 100 is where you fall with the thyroid reset diet. 
there's honestly not great ways to exactly track your intake. So really just by focusing on the green light foods, you'll end up falling in that range. Okay. But is there like a, you know, thinking of just like salt? I mean, let's just say I was just eating vegetables. I'm I'm a vegan and I eat a lot of vegetables and I'm not doing a lot of seasonings on them. But just in terms of just salt by itself, whether it was the Uh kosher salt or whatever, what's the equivalent of like the amount of salt that could be safe for you to take? Or is is the other salt fine as long as it's kosher salt and it's not Himalayan salt or other salts fine? Yeah, the ones that I encourage have really no significant amounts of iodine whatsoever. Okay. So yeah, you don't want to pour a cup of salt down your throat. <laughs> but, okay. but, but yeah, there's really, the quantities are not relevant with, with the good types of salt. Okay. So just stay away from the iodized salt, stay away from the Himalayan salt, which is what I've certainly been using. Um, yep. And what about the salts that are in the mis- in misos? Yeah. So in those cases, soy has some ways by which it may bind iodine. And in general, things where you're talking about if it's a sea salt, if it's less than 500 milligrams per serving, that won't be a factor. Okay. Okay. Um, and then uh, last uh, question about the the um, vaccine. Um, so if they're saying that, you know, the pro that in the, the CDC website says that people were censored who had, you know, autoimmune disease, there are only four areas that they, uh, they say you can take the, the um, vaccine but we're asking you to exercise caution. And there are only four things that are listed and it's autoimmune, I think immunosuppressant, HIV, and maybe pregnant women. And so is it a normal thing that um, that in, you know, four to six months that they are going to do some tests? I mean, I know they do this with other vaccines, but I'm wondering, have you heard anything like that? That if in four to six months, they because all of this, this vaccine was rushed and it was on an emergency basis. And I'm sure, as you said, do you want COVID? (laughs) No. (laughs) But I'm also wondering, is it a normal sort of protocol that we could expect in four to six months that they would do some testing with autoimmune since we are one of the four conditions? One of the Let me just respond to that one real quick. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. So in terms of, uh, I hate the, I hate the um, warp speed. Couldn't think of a worse name for something. And the process was quicker um, and it was rushed for sure, but that doesn't mean that important steps were skipped. All the steps that are normally done were done. And there have been times in which vaccines have been found to have products after they've been out for a little while. The longest time frame historically has been six weeks. So you know when things, when things happen, you think about it like in this sense, if, if some, if a lot of bad things happen right away, then there's milder things that happen a little later, maybe milder things after that. But most things show up rather quickly. And it has been six weeks, even things that have been tracked for years has been the window. And we've got already two months or more. And yeah, right now we've got 25.6 million doses that have been done. And in terms of tracking, they, they haven't done studies in which they were only looking at autoimmune disease but the studies that have been done were open-ended, meaning they were tracking every weird thing that happened. Uh, Extreme example of this, one gentleman was struck by lightning two weeks after his second dose of the Moderna vaccine. No one thought that it was causal, but they're tracking everything. So so yeah, those things have been shown up and tracked. And we'll, we'll learn more, but there's been no data about emergent or issues with autoimmunity. What they do when they ask people about that is they put them in a different line after the shot, so they may watch them for 30 minutes rather than 15. The one thing that has happened is that there's been 11.1 per million people have had anaphylactic reactions. And I looked at the raw numbers of those cases, and yeah, pretty much all are in the first five, 10 minutes. Those that have had past anaphylaxis or severe allergies, have been some have been a little bit later, but half an hour has covered it, and they've all been well-treated. So. I'm not pro-vaccine, you know, I'm (laughs) anti-COVID. That's that's my thing. (laughs) All right, let me get just one or two more. I'm going to get paddled by Kieran if I don't come upstairs for supper pretty quick, but I'm sorry I won't be able to get to all these and that breaks my heart, but let me get one or two more real quick. Okay, so Lim, Lim, let's hear what you have for us. Hi. (laughs) Hey, good evening. Um, I do have like a couple of questions. Um, so I have had hypothyroidism for about seven years now. And I, in the middle of that sometime 
three years after. So I kind of got sick of taking the medication and also my insurance had run out. So I kind of cut myself up off like cold turkey. And then uh, when I did get my insurance back and got tested, it was completely normal okay. for about two years. Okay. Um, and then my doctor just told me that it was because the half-life was long. And Not two years long. <laughs> yeah. So, but after two years, my hormones were going crazy again. So then I had to get back on it and then I've been regulating it. And like last year I checked it again and my dosage needed to be decreased. Mm-hmm. Um, which he thought was odd as well and wanted to send me to an endocrinologist, but pandemic happened and (laughs) situations changed. Yeah. Um, You might be a good candidate for the reset diet and watch your scores and you may well do a lot better promptly. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, And then do you think that, you know, that two year span of being completely normal and feeling amazing, does that happen to often like to people? Um, it can. I'm going to mute real quick. And yeah, there are those that end up having better function back again. And we, we the biggest driver we know of that's more relevant than all their factors is your iodine content. So yeah, be deliberate about that and look at the lists. And I think you've got a really good chance of seeing that recover again because it happened to you before by accident. So that's really cool. Okay, last one. Ah, let's get let's, next up on the list. Let's get Sophia here. And hey, you guys. Um, I'll do another one of these next month. We'll talk about medications then. We'll do questions. And again, I'm on social media Mondays on at 4 o'clock on Mountain Time, which is 3 Pacific or 6 Eastern. <laughs> we don't change time zones in Arizona, so I really got to think about that to get it right. But yeah, Sophia, uh, let's hear what you have. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Dr. Christensen. Uh, sorry, my camera is not working. That's why it's not on. So um, I have just one question. I think it was asked in a different way. So you kind of stopped me there with no iodine. This is news for me because I've been reading quite a few books, as you know, around who are talking about take iodine. Okay. So there is a lot of, if you go on um, government sites, both in Canada, where I live and in USA, you see that the iodine in the soil is almost none left. So the whole idea that the other authors are, are talking about is that, okay, the kale and the chards and all the, all the vegetables that should have some iodine have almost none. So I'm asking, where's that iodine for like making the T3 and T4 four hormone? Because that's the three and four. That's where it's coming from, right? Four You're molecules right. of and three molecules of iodine. So the where's this coming 20, from? Yeah, the top 25 sources of iodine in the standard American diet, according to the USDA registry, 23 of those sources have tripled in the last decade. So the U.S. is now categorized by the World Health Organization as being at risk for thyroid disease due to iodine excess. Um, If you're curious more, look at that iodine controversy paper. I went into a lot of detail about why some people are saying something very different, and I answer all those questions in that one. Right. Thank you so much. Okay. And in your, I assume in your book is, that is detailed somewhat? For sure. The book talks okay. about that as well. In the book, I didn't talk about the other authors and their views as much. I talked about the evidence for my side. But so yeah, I, I give plenty of citations and hundreds of references. But yeah, it's yeah all just, I'm just, sorry, I'm just uh, asking about sources, those first sources of iodine or 20 or whatever you, are those in your book? Or they in sure the, are. And, and they're, yeah, it's all, it's all talked about. Thank you so much. Thanks. You're welcome. All right. Good to be with you guys this evening. And yeah, the, the team wanted me to remind you all that the book's still there half off if you want a spare copy for a friend or a loved one. Thanks for being with me this evening. It was good to good to connect with you. And I it breaks my heart to see a lot of hands up, like little yellow symbols. And I wish I could have gotten to more of those. But I, I will get really paddled if I don't go up because Kieran made supper tonight. <laughs> So come on next Monday, join me on social media, grab me for a consult, go on Thyroid Opinion. I'll talk to you one-on-one. We'll cover your questions in good detail. You got that as an option too. And we'll be back next month with more on this and we'll learn more about lowering those antibodies. In the meantime, dial in your iodine, think about the body's fuel load and cover your bases on the food categories. All right. Have a good evening, everyone. And nice to see you all. And we'll, we'll talk in real soon. Bye-bye.